On today's show, is Carter Yakumchuk worth a top five pick? We'll discuss that and a lot more about his game on today's episode of Locked On NHL Prospects. You are Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On this podcast, we, we break down everything prospects related for you five days a week, Monday to Friday. I'm Hattie Kalakesh, Director of North American Scouting for Dauber Prospects, joined by Sebastian High, Head Scout and Director of European Scouting for Dauber Prospects. And on today's show, we'll be breaking down Carter Yakumchuk's game in detail. We'll start off with the puck skills, uh, break down the skating, handling, uh, shooting and passing, as well as the uh, physical game as well. In our second section, Segment, then we'll get into the more intricate stuff the defensive game uh, awareness um decision making you know toolkit all that good stuff then in our final segment we'll break down carter yakum checks projection um which team would be the best fit and is he worth a top five pick there's been a lot of rumblings around that a lot of teams seem to be really high on him we'll discuss that in detail with you today before we get into any of that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. make every moment more right now new customers can get up to 150 dollars in bonus bets with any winning five dollar money line bet that's 150 bucks if your team wins so visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started if you're watching on youtube make sure to look, like and subscribe leave us a comment letting us know what you want us to talk about next and if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform leave us a rate and review and make sure to make us your first listen of the day so let's get things started right away with carter yakumchuk's profile um talk me through the size handedness uh and how many points has he put in uh, put up this season in the whl because that's a pretty impressive total um and then we'll del- delve into the uh puck skills in just a second but let's start with the profile here with yakumchuk yeah, so Carter Yakimchuk is a six foot three, hundred and ninety four pound right shot defenseman who's quite old for this draft class as a late September 05 birthday. And in terms of the production, as you mentioned, it is uh, very strong. Uh, through sixty six games with the Calgary Hit, man, he scored thirty goals and seventy one points. He is a real goal scorer from the blue line, and we'll get into that later on in this segment. But uh, so far this season, he's almost exclusively been ranked in that ten to twenty range by public outlets. Uh, uh, including Dopper Prospects. We had him ranked at 18th overall on our most re- recent ranking. And uh, that said, NHL teams are often fans of big right shot defensemen with heavy point shots and excellent handling ability. So there's definitely a possibility of Yakumchuk going in that top 10 range. And we even mocked him in the top 10 in our uh, mock draft episode from uh, from yesterday, uh, where we had him go at 8th to the Ottawa Senators. So uh, he's a very interesting prospect, and there's a, a large variety of outcomes with him, both on draft day and also in his career as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really interesting thing is that, you know, he can end up pretty much anywhere depending on how it plays out on draft day. Um, Like I said, I know a a couple teams for sure have him in their top five. Like he's a he's an athletic player, like the athleticism with him is off the charts. Um, Big, mobile, um, really powerful, uh, both in terms of his stride and in terms of his physique, like he can he can push players around. Um, So let's get into the puck skills. I want to start off with the skating ability. because I, I think it's really unilateral. Uh, it's not a well-rounded skating tool kit. He's, he doesn't have four-way mobility, which is something we we look for a lot as scouts. Um, what he has is a really good forward stride, and that's due to how 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 often he's skating forwards. Um, he's a player who can carry pucks across lines really well, who can blast through the neutral zone really easily when he's skating forwards. Um, but, you know, he's not really facing many scenarios where he is skating backwards or skating laterally. What will often happen is he skates up the ice, creates an opportunity, then skates back quickly to um, get in, get back on the, on the play defensively. So in terms of his play style, it really favors the forward skating. Um, but the forward skating is good. Um, you know, overall, probably give a skating a five and a half, maybe a six, just due to the... I mean, it's not the best. He doesn't have the most agility or, or, or you know, or lateral balance in terms of, you know, staying on his feet while moving laterally or backwards. 
But when he's skating forwards, he's so hard to stop because he's got that long stride, that long, powerful stride moving forwards. He, he, he can close gaps really quickly um, when he gets back after an opportunity. So there's a lot to like in terms of the skating. I'd give it a five and a half, six overall. Um, but, you know, the forward skating is like an eight and the backwards and lateral skating is probably like a four and a half. So it, it kind of evens out at the end of the day there. Uh, but let's move on to the handling, because I think in terms of the puck skills, like that's the big standout with Yakumchuk, right? It certainly is. The handling ability is dynamic, and it complements that forward that, that that forward speed and the like the power he has when he's moving forward up the ice extremely well. It makes him one of the more, more dangerous rush attacking blue liners in the entire CHL because he is such a high end handler. He is he can handle on his backhand, on his forehand. He switches between the two very fluidly, and I, I would like to see some more like lateral agility in his rush to make them a little bit more projectable to the NHL level. And that would be, I think, one qualm I do have with this forward skating. But uh, as for the puck handling, it is a, a real strength. And it, it sub, it's, a, it's a tool that allows them to take some big risks because more often than not, they pay off. But uh, risk is definitely a big part of Carter Yakimchuk's game. And there are definitely moments where it comes back to bite him and his team. For sure. So for me, the, the handling skill really is dependent on you know, the fact that he's able to blast through players of a speed uh, and keep control of the puck. That's one thing I've really liked about his game is that he, when he gets going, even at top speed, when he does that forehand, backhand deke through an, through, through a, a, an opponent, especially through defenders uh, heading into the offensive zone, he keeps control of the puck. Like, he, he doesn't seem out of control. It doesn't seem like he's about to lose it. Um there's, it's not as erratic as it looks. There's still some control to his game when he's when he's stick handling. So, handling wise for me, he gets a good seven, seven and a half. I really, really like the ability to move um, at top speeds, the ability to keep control of, of pucks at top speeds. But the shot is no knock either. I mean, you don't score thirty goals from the blue line without a bomb, uh, and Yakubchuk certainly, certainly has one. Um, the, the wrister is great, and I feel like it really complements uh, his ability to blast through the neutral zone to get to get through the first, second layers of, of defense. Um, and the creativity he has with his handling, it gets him into dangerous ice. And from there, he's able to wire a top shelf off the wrister. But he also has a bomb of a one-timer slap shot from the point on the power play. Um, he's able to... Uh, settle pucks quickly into his wheelhouse in order to get them to get them off, and you know he, you don't need to pass the puck cleanly on you know in his wheelhouse in order for him to get a good shot off. Like it can be a bit wider off his body, but closer to his feet, you can still wire it um, on net. And what I really like about a shot is he's got that kind of seeing eye shot that just finds a way through a crowd. Um, that that's something that I've really really found interesting in in Yakumchuk's game is that a lot of his shots you don't expect them to go in they just do. Um, so there, there's a, there's a quality to that. It's an art uh, from, from the blue line there. And I feel like Yakim checks mastered that fairly well already. Um, the passing though, the passing, I have a bit more issues and concerns with. They most mostly have to do with decision-making and how his hands interact with his brain in terms of passing. And we'll get to that when we talk about the toolkit in the second segment, but in isolation, I also think that there isn't as much variability in his passing. Um, he plays kind of Trevor Conley hockey at times, or he's trying to he's trying to get the primary assist from the blue line, which is a bit of a weird thing. Like usually your defenseman's the guy kind of directing the passes in 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 the direction in which you know he wants the offense to to, to come from. So usually your defenseman isn't necessarily getting the primary assist. He's directing play towards the guy who gets the primary assist. But with Yakimchuk, he's just He's often trying to connect with guys in the slot. He's often trying to 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 make those little shot passes for tip ins. So like the passing's really intriguing as well. Um, but I, I like I said, I don't think it's as variable uh, as, as it could be. Um, but last but not least, talk about the physicality because I mean this guy's a freak athlete, right? 
He is. He is really strong and extraordinarily aggressive. He likes to use his physicality, and he's racked up the penalty minutes to boot this season. Again, through uh, he's played sixty six games, and he's logged uh, like over one hundred and twenty eight or something penalty minutes. Uh, it's been a lot of penalties, um, and the physicality is definitely something that he has been using a lot. Uh, if a team is drafting him and they want to develop him as a more of a two way player than just a pure offensive player you're going to try, want to build around the physicality rather than than the defensive habits as the thing to found that defensive upside on and uh yeah it is a clear strength i think in terms of, of our grading scale i'd give it a seven maybe seven and a half in terms of the physicality the decision making behind that physicality is a lot more variable and we'll definitely jump into that in the next segment but the raw tools of this player are across the board very strong uh with the exception obviously of like maybe like the raw playmaking and the four-way mobility yeah for sure i'd say those are the main two issues with the tools the rest is pretty good uh but that wraps things up with our first segment we'll get into our second we'll delve a bit more deeper into the intricate stuff with yakim chuck's game we'll talk about the toolkit the habits the decision making all that good stuff in just a second but just before a quick word from our sponsors at policy genius Life insurance is such an important safety net for you and your family, but trying to find the right policy with all the options that are out there is really, really difficult. And that's where Policy Genius comes in. Um, Policy Genius helps you compare your options from top companies, and their team of licensed uh, experts is on hand to help talk you through it. Uh, you can talk to a team of award winning agents who will walk you through the process step by step. And you can that way, you can easily compare quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price for life insurance. Your work life insurance policy might not really offer enough protection for you and your family and even worse than that if you leave your job if you get fired if anything happens on that end unfortunately your life insurance doesn't follow you um you know if you leave your job so policy genius gives you unbiased advice from a licensed team of experts they have no incentive to recommend one insurer over the other so you're safe to in the knowledge that they're giving you the best advice the best prices uh and the best ideas in terms of where to get your life insurance and thousands of five-star reviews on google and trustpilot from customers who found the best fit for their needs uh helps you stay reassured in the fact that they're doing the job right uh so check life insurance off of your to-do list in no time with policy genius visit policygenius.com slash locked on nhl or click the link in the description below to get your free life insurance quote and see how much you can save that's policygenius.com slash locked on nhl Alrighty, so moving on to our second talk, a segment, we'll be talking about the more intricate stuff in uh, Yakim Chuck's game. We'll start off with the toolkit, because I think that there's a lot of things that interact well and other things that int don't interact as well. And I think the main issue for me with Yakim Chuck is the brain. There's a lot of um, brain farts, quite simply. Like, there are moments where you want to pull your hair out, hair out being like, what are you doing, man? Uh, but yeah, let's start off with the with the interaction between the feet and the, and the brain. Um... There's a lot of overcommitting in Yakumchuk's game, both offensively and defensively, right? Like that's that's the main thing that stands out when you watch him is he's kind of all over the place. And we talked about how um he's he's really good in terms of forward speed and from forward acceleration, mainly because he spends so much time skating forwards. That can be a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, but usually a player who spends that much time skating forwards isn't really um ahead of the play, right? Yeah, I don't think Yakimchuk is very often ahead of the play. He's often creating plays, and he's often committing to plays, but uh, he's often also left chasing plays as a result of that. So uh, there's definitely a lot of room to work with uh, with Yakimchuk. I think that the, the, the tools give him a very high-end ceiling, but whoever drafts him, especially if they're doing so with a top 15 draft selection, you're going to want to put in a lot of work to make sure that he can get a handle on uh, the habit side of the game and being able to identify the situations when taking a risk is intelligent and when it, it does actually benefit him and his specific toolkits. Like for instance, he's not particularly adept at pivoting. So when he's skating forwards and play gets past him, turning around and re-accelerating backwards, that takes a lot of time for him. He's also this really big player, obviously, as we mentioned, and that makes it all the, the more slow. So he can he can really be, get taken out of plays when he doesn't quite 
connect, whether it be on a hit, whether it be on a poke check, whether it be offensively and activating and losing possession in some way. Uh, that, that happens a lot. So I think that, that the interaction between the brain and the feet is certainly an area with a lot of question marks. But on the flip side, one area that I think is very strong is the interaction between the shot and the handling ability. Those two work tremendously well together. And he's able to mesh his powerful shot. And as you mentioned, quite intelligent shot selection. I mean, he spams shots often, oftentimes from the point. But he also can identify the, the, the shooting lanes very well. He times those shots extremely well. He gets pucks through on goal. He's not necessarily a player that, that, that hits a ton of shin pads all the time. And uh, he uses his hands to open up those shooting lanes for himself. He's able to yeah. uh, get around the single four checker, get a shot off from the high slot. He's able to open up space along the blue line, walk the blue line, use his hands to retain possession to get more towards the middle of the ice rather than shooting from the perimeter and uh, i think that's one clear area of strength in the interaction between some tools yeah for sure and you alluded kind of to the habits um that we can discuss here with the the spamming shots from the blue line i agree like he's, he's shooting a lot um but i do want to say i i'd rather a player who shoots everything on net and have it just just kind of establishing a filter with that player of when to shoot and what and when not to shoot then taking a player who doesn't have a shooting mindset and trying to instill in him oh you should shoot more here because i feel like that's kind of a cliche of oh just you know put the buck on the net shoot more but like there's there's an art to it there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a way to read plays um you know and and, and there's habits that are instilled in a player kind of naturally in the way that they play the way that they approach the game so i I, I prefer a player like Yakumchuk who shoots all the time and just kind of installing a filter in his, you know, kind of ingraining a filter in, in, into the way that he that he approaches shooting and goal scoring. Um, then a player, for example, like, uh, I don't know, Aron Kiviharyu, right, who doesn't really shoot all that often and is almost always looking for the pass, almost always looking for the, 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 the low, low to high type of play. Um to kind of re kind of recycle possessions down low. So for me, just that's a bit easier to work with, but in terms of decision-making, I think this is a main issue and that's, this is a main reason why Yakumchuk is so contentious in the scouting world. Um, and especially why um, we have a bit of pause on our end regarding his, his top five or top 10 upside. Is that like the, the decision-making is so strange, so mind bogglingly difficult at times and there's a reason why he has 120 penalty minutes. I don't think I've seen Carter Yakumchuk fight a single time, to give you an idea. Those are minors that he's getting. Like, those are minor penalties, 120 minutes worth of minor penalties. It's 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 a lot. Um, and a lot of them have to do with roughing, um, hooking, kind of getting back on plays, being a tiny bit late, trying to get a stick in, 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 the, um, in the opponent's uh, hands and that type of stuff. So lots of questions regarding decision-making there with Yakumchuk, right? Definitely lots of question marks there, and I think the same applies to the defensive side of the puck as well. When he's defending the rush, uh, he really likes to use his physicality to uh, just smother transition often into the boards, but he also yeah. gets over-aggressive. He often tries to make that play before they even hit uh, his own blue line, and then that has, in my view, and it's quite regularly led to two-on-ones against. So there's there's definitely this like the the risk assessment gauge in uh, those aggressive like initiations of of, of, of trying to, to to shut down the rush uh, in the neutral zone. Uh, yeah, that's been a lot of that in my viewings, which uh, will need to be tinkered with uh, certainly with with time, and uh, will 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 need a lot of refinement before he's a an NHL caliber transition defender. Despite being like like so physical and having a really long reach that he can use quite well to patrol a large area, the backward mo mobility is a bit of a detracting uh, asset there in in his rush defending as well. But uh, yeah, the decision making. I think is the crux of most of the qualms that many scouts have with Yakumchek's projection. Yeah, I also don't think it's it's just on the defensive side. Like, you know, you mentioned the spamming shots. I also think that like like we mentioned in the first segment, the way that he approaches passing isn't in a chest-like way. It's more in a, you know, 
I'm going to pass this puck really hard on my teammate's stick in the slot. And, you know, fingers crossed. Let's see what happens. Is that type of thing? Uh, so I've, I've got a bit more pause and questions regarding that area of his game. Um, and it also shows up when he gets the puck and he's blasting through the neutral zone. He'll try to beat three, four defenders with, with moves um, to try to get to the net. And, you know, the more I talk about this prospect, the more I think about Logan Mayu. Um, who's got a lot of the same issues, a lot of the same strengths, a lot of the same weaknesses. I think Carter Yakumchuk's a a more a more refined, more improved, and more overall um, kind of polished. You know, the, the issues aren't as glaring as with Mayu's and his draft year. Now, Logan Mayu's developed really, really well. The Habs have a great development system. They're able to um, giving give him a bit more kind of things to work with. They've they've rounded out the decision making issues. Um, so I think that if the right team gets their hands on him, you could see a similar path where within the next three, four years, you see Yakumchuk slowly but surely develop better habits, slowly but surely develop better decisions. Um, I think that could be kind of the blueprint moving forward for Yakumchuk and how he develops his game. But that's our second segment. We'll get into our third segment where we talk about uh, Yakumchuk's upside, which team would be the best fit for him. Is he worth a top five pick? Answering a lot more questions on that end regarding Yakumchuk. But just uh, before we get into that, a quick word from responses to the FanDuel. It's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL, and FanDuel's getting you a shot to bring home a, w- a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and far more, including single game parlays, which are my personal favorite, as they allow you to hand select a handful of stats that you want to swing on yourself and they can make the action all the more exciting especially when you're attending an event live visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count fanduel america's number one sports book all righty so let's clean close things off here with our breakdown of carter yakumchuk's upside which team would be the best fit for him and whether or not he's worth a top five pick. Because again, there's been a lot of discussions around that. I know for a fact that a couple teams have him really, really high uh, in the 2024 NHL draft. So let's get started here with the upside for Yakumchuk. So realistically, what's the best case scenario in terms of where Yakumchuk ends up in an NHL lineup? Are we talking a number one, number two, or number three, number four defenseman? Where do you see this realistically panning out for him? I've got my own idea, but I want to hear yours. I mean, the upside is real with this player the offensive impact could be sky high i do think he caps that as a number two i don't think that he's a type of player that you can fully rely on to be that number one defenseman that you can play in all situations that you can rely on in that last minute of the game um yeah. necessarily because again the decision making woes are quite significant at this stage and even if they are patched they're never going to be an overt strength at the nhl level especially in first pairing minutes uh, but that said, if he has a, a left shot defenseman to insulate him a little bit, allow him to take those risks because he's at his best when he's taking risks. Like he needs to take those risks to have that big impact offensively. Uh, but if he can trust his pairing mate to like sweep up any mistakes he doesn't end up making uh, to allow him to play with that longer leash, I think that you, that you might be able to get a, a really dynamic number two defenseman out of this player. But there's a wide range of possible outcomes here. He could also tap out as like, a number six that you trust with very few even strength minutes, but you allow to, to, to quarterback a first or a second power play, right? Like there's a, a whole bunch of possible outcomes with this player. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I kind of see the same thing, kind of a number two in terms of upside, a player who doesn't necessarily, um, isn't necessarily the cornerstone of a, of a contender on defense, but as a player who can play big minutes, who you you can rely on to skate the puck up, to create something when you need him to create something, um, and to just blast pucks on net consistently. Um, you know, this is a type of player who plays well within a structure that has to do with shoot and retrieve. A team like Carolina, um, you know, if they get their hands on a, on a Carter Yakumchuk style player, like this is the type of player that fits well in that system. They love their their shoot and retrieve hawk. They love, you know, blasting pucks on net from wherever, retrieving them, trying again. Um, it's all about volume more than kind of quality. 
And I think that describes Yakumchuk to a T. You know, this is the type of player who, in the right system, can be a number two, number three defenseman. I think that there are some significant limitations to his game. Um, there are lim- those; these are limitations that usually take a long time to figure out. If they are figured out, these are difficult things to kind of get a grasp on. It's not just in terms of oh, you know, doing some power skating, you know, improving your your leg strength. Like Yakumchuk already has all that. It's between the head, it's between the ears that the issue is. Um, that's a bit more difficult to work with, but it's not unfixable. Um, scouting and, and development have become a lot more streamlined, a lot more um, specialized in the last few years. You know, we've seen more and more teams invest more and more money, more and more resources in these areas because issues are becoming more fixable. So I'm not, I don't think that Jagrmchuk's a lost cause just because he makes some some absurd decisions at times, but. You know, there's a lot to work with here with Yakumchuk, and I feel like if the right team gets their hands on him, um, you know, he could be a really, really interesting prospect. But again, it it's really contingent on the right team getting their hands on him. Because if if he if he lands on a team that has dinner with him once a month and that's their that's their development, it's, it's, he's not going to be much in the NHL. Um, but let's move on to uh, which team would be the best fit. Because I think of this, I mean, there's a range of outcomes here for Yakumchuk, um, anywhere from from three to I'd say nineteen twenty, I think is is where he can go uh, in the draft, depending on which teams pick where, you know, what their preferences are. Um, in that range, are there any teams that you're looking at, like, oh, this would be a really good fit for him? Yeah, I think a couple teams would come to mind. Uh, on the one hand, I could see the Minnesota Wild at thirteenth overall be a really good fit for a player like Yak. Chuck, on the one hand, there wouldn't be the massive pressure to have to be the number one right D in that organization with Brock Faber uh, putting a bit of a stranglehold on that role uh, as, of, as of this season. Um, and I think that the Wild would be a system in which Yakumchuk could very much play his type of role because they have so many such capable de- defensive defensemen that are so hyper intelligent and uh, can sweep up any mistakes that Yakim Trike might make. Uh, and I think another organization that could be really fun, uh, I don't know how, how successful it would be as a pick, but uh, that 14th overall selection for the San Jose Sharks, I think would be really entertaining seeing uh, Macklin Celebrini and Carter Yakim Chuck on a power play one day. That would be fun. Uh, and obviously, Yakimchuk yeah, would have to practice a little bit on that uh, quarterback role on the power play rather than being the, the, the shot man himself because Celebrini has a shot worthy of passing to. But uh, I think that could be a really fun combination someday. For sure. I, 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 that would be really interesting, uh, especially with San Jose needing um, some, some right-handed Ds especially, but defense overall. Um, you know, I feel like this would be a directional swing in terms of, you know, where Mike Greer is going with this. Because if he goes with a Carter Yakumchuk style player, he's going all in on offense. He's going all in on uh, fun, entertaining, chaotic, uh, no thoughts, just vibes hockey, uh, which would be really, really interesting in terms of a uh, a stylistic choice of, uh, uh, of direction to take this hockey team in. Because they've got a lot of really interesting, really fun, really... Uh, enjoyable pieces, um, a lot of chaotic pieces if they add in Carter Yakimchuk as well into that mix. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's like I said, there's a range of outcomes. You know, who knows? Maybe Chicago pulls a a just a very strange one and picks him at two. Like, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, there's a there's a really wide range of outcomes. Like, again, I know Archam Levshinov and Anton Salaya, but again, I've heard. Around the grapevine, that Carter Yakumchuk is in that mix for a lot of teams. I don't know about Chicago, but there's a couple teams in which he's definitely in that mix. Um, other than that, if we're looking at kind of the five, six, seven range, like would Montreal make this bet? I don't know. They, they like. I think the idea is they're definitely they going forward. forward. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. They're definitely going forward. Um, but if it's not Montreal, I mean, look at the few teams after them. Um, I wouldn't pass. I wouldn't put it past Utah uh, to pick them. Like their scouting staff, no. the same from or, last year. I wouldn't. I wouldn't put them past them, right? Or Ottawa. Yeah, I think. I think either either uh, Utah or Ottawa would be my bets of uh, top ten selecting teams that could take that swing. Uh, those are both organizations that put a lot of value on raw tools and physicality and individual offensive abilities, all of which Yakumchuk possesses. And there are also teams that have taken their fair share of swings on players 
who have had some question marks around that decision-making facet of the game. So there, yeah. there, might, there might be a little bit less aversion to this style of player this high up in the draft class with those organizations. But even Seattle, I mean, I'm still trying to pin down their drafting philosophy with a couple of drafts yes. under their belt at this stage. But it's too uh, early to they, went, yeah. they went, they went, with, with, they went with Caden Price and uh, Lucas Dragasevic in the second and third rounds last year. I mean, hey, if they like picking chaotic defensemen out of the, the WHL. Carter Yakimchuk might be right up their alley. Absolutely. That's just another one in the in the list of them. Uh, and yeah, let's just answer the question. Is Carter Yakimchuk worth a top five pick? I don't think so. I think he's a he's a 12 to 20 guy. This is the same conversation we had with Beckett Seneca. Um, he's, he's being put in the top five due to the raw tools, the athleticism, uh, and the uh, great stick handling ability, uh, but there's a lot of concerns of this game. The concerns are different between Seneca and, and Yakimchuk, and obviously they're two completely different players. But the idea is the same. They're touted as top five because they're 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 big athletic guys um, who have who have great hands. But there's a lot of questions around the decision making, and we see. I think we both see him more as twelve to twenty, right? Like that's the kind of range we're talking about for him. That is the range. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that wraps things up for today's show. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Leave us a comment letting us know what you want us to talk about next and what you thought of the episode. And where do you think Carter Yakumchuk is going to end up? Leave that in the comments down below. If you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, please leave us a rate and review and make sure to make us your first listen of the day. For your second listen of the day, make sure to check out Locked On Sports today. They've got all your news and updates about what's going on around sports. And make sure to tune in for our next show as we continue our prospect coverage for the month of May. This has been Hattie Calica director of North American Scouting for Dauber Prospects with Sebastian High, head scout and director of European Scouting for Dauber Prospects straight from Europe. And we hope you tune in next time.